So I, I said it yesterday, the famous fire hose. Has everyone seen this, the actual fire hose over in this data center? And so, you know, as I said, we're going to throw a lot at you, and the, the trick is to see if we can give you enough tools to work with um, going forward. Now, what happens typically is I get emails four, five, ten years later where people said, I remember something that was thrown at us in that, that fire hose thing, and it really helped me at that point. So I'd rather give you more content faster than uh, leave some things out. So before we get really started, why care about business models? Now, I don't know if we have people old enough in the audience to recognize this device. Anybody? OK. Uh, if you don't recognize that, do you recognize that? How many people recognize the one on the right? OK, it's an iPod. All right. So. This was introduced to the Rio player in uh, 1998. Those are the specs <coughs> around it. It was a $200 item. And we'll come back to what happened to it. Uh, look at the specs for the iPod. They're not substantially different, except that it cost twice as much and it had a bunch more storage. Now, why don't you, why don't, doesn't any of you recognize the, the Rio, the one on the, on the left? I mean, it's almost technically the same, right? A couple years earlier, could have had the market. Well, it did have some, there were some technical issues and a few other things. And what people talk about is the iPod was actually had the beginnings of the Apple easy to use type thing. But the real thing underneath it was the business model of the iPod. Does anyone know what that was? What was connected to the iPod? iTunes. And, and iTunes was a place you could go and buy your content, and you could get it seamlessly and everything else. It just worked. Where the Rio, you had to go you know, maybe um, burn your, uh, strip your DVDs and, or your CDs at the time and load them up. It was a little cumbersome. But what the iTunes did by providing a big music store, it was a model that protected the revenue from iPod. It turned out in the early days, Apple made most of its revenue from the hardware sales. The iTunes was really uh, a protective thing that kept other people out. You know, why would you go with another player if you could get the iPod and get music that easily? Now, later on, iTunes made a bunch more money over time. So my point here is this is technology that's almost the same, but the reason one succeeded and the other failed was really the business model uh, behind it. OK, so the goals, this is the topic. So I always try to give you an overview of the night. We're going to talk about different kinds of things relating to business plans. I'm going to talk a bit about the business model canvas. Uh, I'm going to talk about some components of business models. There's another way of looking at it. We'll talk a bit about lean startup. I'll give you a few more examples of models. And then we'll look at valuation. Does it matter what kind of business model you have? And then some tips on how to implement a model. OK, so that's where we're going tonight. So let's start off and remember the three whys from yesterday. First one was, why this? Why is this idea worth pursuing? The, um, the size of the market or, or the problem. What was the second W? Why now? Right? Why is this the right time to do it? Convergence of opportunity and solution. And the third? Why this team? And why do I think these guys will win? And certainly experience. We talked about that with that, uh, the two different business uh, exec summaries last night. But if you don't have experience, one of the things that's going to help you in answering the third W is the business model you put in place. That is, a team without a lot of experience, but with a well thought out model, will get attention from the people that are looking at you. At least that's my hypothesis. OK, and we had this one last night. The, the business basics, really, it was create value. And remember, Bob talked a lot about customers and the value you create and this pyramid of where you are on it. And the second part was, could we capture some of that so we could do it again, either in the form of profit or something that makes it sustainable? And that latter part, the how do you capture it, that's really the business model. OK, so that's the context. And <clears throat> so the question is, what is a business model? Nice, nice term. Well, it, it tells you what the business does. 
You've got a customer, but a customer is not a business. If the business does something with a customer just to connect up with Bob. And so it also says, how does a business make money or capture value uh, in doing the things they do? So let's give some examples. What is Google's, at its core, what is Google's business model? As simply as you could define it. Anybody? Yeah. Advertising. Uh, yeah. Could you refine it just a bit? So companies pay them to put their links on top of search results, whether it's um, okay. So he said advertising, and you're talking about ads sense. Yeah. Okay, but un fundamentally, how does how does it make money? When okay, so it's a pay per clip. It, it makes money when people click, right? Because it gets it gets paid. It does a lot of things to be able to do that, but at its core, I think that's how Google and its basic search thing works. What about cable TV? How does cable TV? What's its commer commercials? Louder? Yeah. Subscriptions. Okay, but what is it subscribing to when you have a cable? Content. Okay, so its model, though, of cable TV is it provides you content. And where does it get that content? From somebody. And okay. Netflix or something. Yeah, so, but the, the core of what they do is they buy content wholesale and they sell it retail, and they make money in between. They buy content from whoever, and they turn around and sell it to you in pieces at a higher price. So it's really, what you, and when you talk about a business model, you want to come down to something as simple as that if you can. Another definition is, uh, how does the firm use its resources, cash, people, technology, to uh, provide its customers with more value and um, make money doing so. And it tells you what value you create, what portion of the value you can capture by looking at who pays for it, how often do they pay for it, and what does it take to deliver that value. That's the fundamental thing underneath it. Now let's look at a business model. This is actually a, a portrayal of a business model. Um, and the problem is you want to try to make it as simple as possible. In this case, I actually saw this as a slide in a, in a presentation, and I couldn't figure out what it was. A is the existing business model, and B is the proposed business model. I doubt anyone could figure out what it is. I certainly couldn't. But if I show you the next slide, there, there is what it was talking about. This is a model of building a bridge, the world's tallest bridge in France, to bridge from one plateau, one um, you know, Piedmont thing to the other, and charge money for you to go across there instead of all over the place. It's a very simple model. And so the, the issue is if you can begin to describe uh, your business model very simply, people get it, and it means you understand it, and it means you probably have figured out how you're going to make money doing it. I'm a little afraid to get on this, uh, this bridge. It's like 1,100 feet tall. And I actually saw a, uh, one of those how did they build it type things. And when they got there to connect the last two pieces, the temperature during the day you know, would throw the things off by four or five inches. It really, really was quite an engineering marvel. But the point here is simple and elegant. If you could explain, I'm going to make money by getting people from A to B in the simple thing, and they're going to pay me for it. I think you could relate to that. So let's, let's look at, let's step back in time. We always can learn from, from history. And let's put ourselves back at the beginning of the original WWW. In this case, the World Wide Wireless. Okay? So we're talking about broadcast radio. Now we know what you need for broadcast radio is you need transmission equipment to put it out there. You need to have things to receive it. And you need to have something you broadcast, content. So if we're sitting back at the beginning of this era, what business model alternatives might we come up with? How would you make money in broadcast radio? What are the options? Advertising? Advertising? OK. Any, any others? 
subscription, in other words, like, like cable or something. Any other? Communication. Well, by, what do you mean by, who said that? <laughs> Communication? Or? Yes, but maybe you can transfer information. Okay, okay. transfer information, all right. And you are you allowed to patent the radios and sell the hardware? Sorry, you can what? You're allowed to patent the radios and sell the hardware. Yeah, you could sell the, right? You could have a model where um, I'm going to put this stuff out there and then sell you the radio and make my money on the hardware. That was sort of like a little bit iPod, right? Sold you the hardware and you could access their content. Okay, there are those, and, and I think we capture them. There's a pay per message, the, a telegraph type thing. There's a uh, one time fee on receivers. I think they do that in, in the British system. Right, that's the tax on, on receivers. And there's advertising. Now, today we know advertising is sort of what happens there. But let's look at how it developed over time. And what I want to do here is, you see the subtitle here is Business Models Evolve. So let's look at the history of this and put yourself back as if you were an entrepreneur in the era when you're thinking, I think this radio thing is really a real potential. So the history was, Wireless was around in the 1890s or so, and um, British um, Marconi, and in military use in World War I, uh, introduced a lot of people to the concept of wireless communication. So after the, world is o uh, the war is over, uh, a couple of years later, RCA, Radio Corporation of America, is formed. And it's sort of an interesting story. It's a, it was a combination of uh, General Electric that held some key patents, AT&T, which had uh, patents on vacuum tubes, um, Westinghouse, and United Fruit. I've never quite figured out what United Fruit was doing in there. Um, and the model that they chose was one-to-one -one communication. And they, what they looked around, they said, well, we can broadcast stuff long distances without laying all of that cable, like the submarine cable, under the Atlantic. And back then, it was 25 cents a word to send a telegraph from the US to London or London to the US. I looked it up, uh, and that would be the equivalent of $3.25 per word. So if you think the uh, abbreviations on texting are important, it really would be important if you're paying $3.25 for every word you send on your text. At the same time, uh, RCA charged 30% less. Okay, so that was the first. It was a fee for uh, service model. And then a couple years later, um, we saw the beginnings of actual broadcast radios because uh, the equipment was becoming more available to transmit. And people could actually build receivers. If you were a tinkerer, you could build a little receiver with a crystal and, you know, like kids do today. And the model was that the retail, they were all local because these are not high power uh, broadcast things. And so the stations were sponsored by stores or retailers. So it would be WXXY or whatever brought to you by you know, the local farm uh, cooperative or Macy's department store. And then quickly, a few years later, four years later, we see National Broadcasting System, or NBC, uh, come along. And what, what it was doing there in the original early broadcast stuff, these were independence um, stations each of which had to broadcast some new content. Someone said, well, if we, could send it, if we could grab them all together and put them into a network, then we could share content, we could syndicate. And so that became um, a, almost a two-sided model, which we'll talk about. So that's the evolution over a relatively short time. But if you're thinking about it from an entrepreneur and you think about why did they do these, well, the first one is because they didn't have a lot of radios out there for people to listen to. So they found Bob's point of the speed, you know, his point of the pyramid, where people were paying three, the equivalent of $3.25 per word. And they said, well, we could broadcast that, undercut it, and make a bunch of money. And then as the technology evolved more, uh, it, it enabled more transmission equipment and receivers. Then the model shifted to a, a retail sponsored. And then when enough of it was out there in enough stations, it shifted again. So sometimes when you're starting something, and you take Bob's pyramid from last night, you'd start at one thing and you begin to progress down that as the technology matches you know, what you can do with it. So it's a way of thinking about it. Always business models evolve over time. If they don't evolve, they probably end up dying. Okay? 
So let's try another um, um, problem. Um, let's say we have an existing product. It's used in offices. It's messy and semi-toxic. And being a good person talking to customers and with technology, you come up with a solution that is uh, avoids the use of messy chemicals and special materials. The benefits is that it's quick and it's clean. Okay, so there's the basic setup. Now, the prevailing business model at the time is a razor razor blade model. So they sell you the machine, or they give you the machine or sell it to you cheap, and they make it up on the, mater on the materials, the supplies. That's the Gillette razor razor blade model. So you look at that and say, okay, maybe that's what I should follow. And then you do a little calculation and you say, whoops, my machine is gonna be six to seven times more expensive than what's in the market. And I can't go and license this to a man, I don't really wanna manufacture this stuff. A lot, of, a lot of people who have technologies would just as soon license it. I hear that all the time. It can work, but most of the time you actually have to go build something. And so, and in this case though, the existing manufacturers were not interested at all. And why would we buy and get a license to build something six or seven times more expensive and only get the same price uh, for the supplies? So that's the conundrum, a real live conundrum that faced a group of entrepreneurs. What would you start, how would you start to think about this if you face that situation? Anybody? Remember, we're talking business models to give you a hint. Yeah, up back. Okay, get ahead and sell. Well, what would be the benefit to consumers? You're going to charge the consumers six to seven times more? It's, yeah, okay, but getting ahead fast in order uh, uh, to uh, show an existing incumbent. Uh, but you found the way and then selling it is a classic way to do something, but you do have to get ahead. Um, was your hand up? Yeah. I, right. You give them the machine in the yeah, front. Yeah. Want it, right. Uh, when they already have it. Okay. Okay. So you're on to the same thing. You're saying that's a, that's a razor, razor blade model, but you're saying maybe there's something about this technology that I can actually convince the people that's going to finance this that to help me put those things out there because I have a proposition that's so compelling to the customer, I'm gonna be able to sell a lot of the supplies. That's sort of what's there. Yeah, right behind. Um, the, the premise of the um, setup is that the original solution is semi-toxic and slower than the current solution that we're having. So right. potentially by advertising the quicker and cleaner alternative that, that we're providing Sure. You can argue that by avoiding that, that time cost and by avoiding that cleanup involved in the traditional solution, yeah. you're saving money. For example, if people get sick, you have to pay their insurance. Okay. So you're looking at it and say, I'm going to look at the technology and I'm going to convince people this is better, both from a, a cost saving to you because you don't have all this toxic stuff and everything. And that certainly could be a viable way of doing it. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to jump to it unless you have one other. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but still the premise there is that you're going to sell a lot more, all right? So, but so you're on. You're all onto it. You're trying to figure it out. Here's here's what this case actually is. This is Xerox, Xerox copiers. They adopt. They marketed those machines um, directly instead of through the manufacturer. They leased it. So along the lines you were saying, at a low cost and charged a, a fee if you, so for your monthly lease, you got 2,000 copies. And it was, a, it was a reasonable fee. Now the key here was at the time, the average business copier made 15 to 20 copies, or to 20 copies per day. So 300 to 400 a month. So they went in and they said, if you, if you lease our machine, you can have five times the number of copies. Uh, for the price that I'm, I'm giving you. And here are all the benefits I have. You don't have the, you know, the smell and the cleanup and everything. 
And in order for that to succeed, you had to have a huge number of more copies made. And what we know is from photocopies that it was so easy to do as opposed to the old slimy thing. And so by looking at this, the net result was Xerox launched this model and made 41% compound annual growth over the next decade. But think about it from a business model viewpoint. You're there trying to raise money because under this model, you need to finance a machine that's six to seven times more expensive. And you've got to convince somebody, uh, like your investors, that I'm going to be able to get the customers to use this five times more than they're currently using it. And oh, by the way, they'll, they'll put it in many locations because the machine is you know, compact and you don't have to vent the stuff and everything. So it's a daunting business model sell to people. And they obviously did that. And probably, I don't know this part of the story. We're going to talk about lean startup in a few minutes. They probably went out and tested the concept with some people about, you know, would you lease this for this price? Saw how many copies they made and realized, I've got evidence that people will use this machine more substantially. As, as an investor, I'd want to know that. This is a real leap of faith. But you see, by looking at the business model, they were able to take this thing and get it to market. But you had to be kind of creative about it. OK, let's look at a, something in the healthcare area. This is SciTech. And it has to do with cervical cancer screening. <clears throat> and the observation here was um, there were false positives, or false negatives, right? A problem. They wouldn't, the, the test would not catch the cancer. That's, that's a problem. Um, but the problem is uh, cancers were missed. And who did it affect? Obviously, the patient. But everyone else in the healthcare system, you know, the payer, the physician, and everything, it's a weird system. So let's look into it a little bit more. Their insight turned out in the way you prepared the sample using a thin slice thing would catch more um, uh, cervical cancers. And that would be a big benefit. The problem is the US healthcare system. And just for those who have not experienced the wonders of it, the purchase decision, the person who is getting the benefit is not the person who actually makes the purchase decision because patients typically don't pay directly for things. The person that decides what is going to be ordered um, is dependent on the provision of data that says, this is something I want to order. But they can't really get that data unless those tests are uh, provided and reimbursed so that people use it. So what SciTech did is they, they looked at value chain, and we're going to look at some value chains later tonight. And they said, we're going to figure out a way to disrupt this value chain. Um, and uh, physicians were the sole decision makers on which labs to use. The labs determined which manufacturers they were using. And it all has to relate to reimbursement, because the patients normally don't pay for it. So what they did is they worked with physicians. They showed how this worked. And they gave physicians a form that said, you should think about giving this to your patients. And it basically said 25% of cancers are missed by the tests that I, I, I can prescribe for you that you'll be reimbursed for. Um, there's a test that is not free that will cost $25 that you'd have to pay for. And um, I want to make you aware of this option. Please sign this form if you, as to which option you want to do. And so faced with the idea that there's a, a 3 in 10 chance that this test is not going to catch whether I have cervical cancer, and it's $25, I think a lot of people said, I, let me, I'll pay for the test. It had to totally change the behavior of people and how they interacted with the medical system. So the result was, and if you think about Bob's you know, identifying who the customers are last night, the physicians win because the physician has less liability now, right? Because he, he's not going to be at, at risk for missing something. And he's up to date, and, or she's up to date and can use the technology. The patient certainly wins, right? And the payer gets the information they need um, for, the, uh, for the coverage decision, the system. This was a model that was first used with SciTech, as far as I know, and it was used also for 3D mammography. 
So there's where, in order to get this to the market, they had to disrupt an existing business model and interject what they wanted to do in it in order to make the pieces come together. Yeah? Yeah, the question is, was it really just $25 or not? That I have not been able to find out. There is a case study on it, <clears throat> and I was trying to read up on it today just because I knew someone was going to ask that, that question. But the point was, uh, you know, if that test costs three or $400, there are times when you, when you introduce a product in the market, your beta version, you're off, off usually subsidizing stuff. I'm in the middle of, we just signed, a company that I co-founded signed a big collaboration agreement for an over-the-counter medical device with a major consumer product company. And our first set of sales on that are going to be really heavily subsidized because uh, as we learn, you know, who's going to be buying it, et cetera, we're not going to go out and um, spend the money on, uh, you know, ASICs and things like that until we know more. But the point is, over time, we'll drop that, that cost curve down. Okay, so <clears throat> let's sort of summarize what we've learned a little bit about business models so far. We've seen in the iPod that the solution was partly technical. The iPod was an easier to use machine, although not substantially easier, and it had more capacity, but it cost twice as much. There it was really a, uh, a business model thing that, that, that launched it. it was the, the end result for the customer was that it was easy to use and the content was available. In broadcast radio, we looked at how a model evolves over time as the technology adopts and they can move along. In the case of Xerox, we saw that a financial model or a financial approach actually enabled the whole um, uh, value to be delivered to the customer. But it was a big leap of faith that had to be tested out. And then in SciTech, we saw this is really a, a business this is, that could only get off the ground if it disrupted in some way the existing business model. So I want you to think about all these things. There's no set approach to it but you have to think through what the problems are a bit. So for the rest of <coughs> the topics, I'm going to next talk about the business model canvas. How many people have done a canvas? One, two, only maybe five, five percent? I'm guessing. That's interesting. I, I see them all the time, especially when I go around the country and we go to uh, incubators and accelerators. And, you know, um, there's a program that, I'm, that Bob talked about in the Midwest where uh, we do something on business models and we say, we know they've been to incubators, et cetera. And we say, okay, if you've done a business model canvas, present that the first day. And the problem is it, it's almost, it's become almost a cookbook. And it takes very little time to sort of absolutely destroy what they've done because they haven't asked, answered the kind of questions that Bob was asking last night. Uh, but still, it's something you should know about, um, and it may be useful to you, like some of these other techniques. So th there's a book, Business Model Generation. It's actually an easy one to read, kind of interesting. This is actually <clears throat> the business model canvas. And you can think of it as a bit of a storyboard, the concept of a storyboard when you're making a, a movie or something is you sort of draw it out. You know, here's what it's going to look like. You know, in the Black Panther movie, you know, Here's the first setting, here's the next setting, and you sort of tell the story. In the center of this, there are nine boxes, and the center is the value proposition. And Bob talked a little bit about value proposition tonight, and I'll touch on it in a moment. It's like, you know, what, is, what are you offering uh, that's, that's part of your business? To the right side, these are all customer and channel type things. It talks about what is our relationship with the customer, which talks about things like are we, <clears throat> is it direct sale? Is it uh, through channels or distribution? What is, how, do, what, how do we interact with customers? And then there are different customer segments. You know, which segment are we selling to? And we'll come back to some of that. So that's the right side. We have a value proposition, and we're aiming it at these customers. And here's how we're going to work with these customers. On the left side, is sort of what does it take in terms of activities to deliver that value to the customers on the right? And they talk about you know, what, what has to be done. Uh, what are the resources that are needed? And with this, you can begin to think about, well, do I do it all here or do I outsource? You know, and so you try to figure out you know, how that works. And at the bottom, 
is the economics. What are the costs and revenue? How do I make money on it? So that's sort of the basic canvas. <clears throat> and the idea is you can play around with those and you know, put stickies up and, and do things. Uh, and the problem is a lot of them you see just are really, uh, they're almost like sticky, you know, uh, stickets, post-it type exercise. These have to be really validated in the field with, with actual customers and thinking it through. On the other hand, it is a very useful storyboard to convey what you're doing. As an entrepreneur, you're always, remember, you're always selling. You're always trying to convey what is the vision, what are we doing, making sure everybody's on the same page of music. So it's very useful in that regard. Um, <clears throat> some of the things, if you read the book, they'll talk about some specific kind of business models, and here are some of them. Let's dig into those a little bit. The, the first thing they talk about is unbundling business models. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that's sort of aimed typically at large companies. And the example is uh, uh, mobile uh, telco, mobile service providers. And, and they have to do a bunch of things to deliver uh, the service to you in your, in your iPhone or your Android device. They have to have you know, broadcast, uh, we have to have cell towers. They have a bunch of technology. They don't, they don't actually make the, the handsets. Um, and they have to have a relationship with you, uh, the customer. And so what the telco people did, <coughs> partly, was to unbundle their model and say, where, can we, where should we be focusing? Um, and in fact, unbundling from a startup's pos position could be really, how do you disrupt or change the, the model. So if you've heard of American Tower Corporation, they actually go out and they lease, build and lease tower, the cell phone towers. And they rent out the uh, uh, bandwidth to the various uh, service providers. So somebody came in and said, we'll take over that part. And so you could come in and disrupt an existing business model uh, by having an unbundling solution that had, would have value. What happened with the mobile device, uh, the, the mobile uh, telcos, is they focused on the customer segment. That's why you see all these ads about, you know, on TV from Verizon and AT&T and, and all of that. They're focused primarily on the customer segment. That's not to say they don't have technology, but they've unbundled a bit. The second model that's discussed in the book is the, called the long tail business model. And it says, you know, you've heard of the 80-20 rule usually, you know, like um, <clears throat> only 20 or 20-80. 20 percent of the products out there are what people actually buy, 80 percent of the people buy. And so traditional businesses focus, well, why wouldn't we go where all the customers are? We'll focus and compete where 80 percent of the people are. And that, that could be a viable model, but there are a lot of people in there jostling for position. The long tail says, you know, in an era when you can reach people in a, in a cheaper way, maybe you could look at the 20% of the products, 80% uh, uh, of the products there that 20% of the people buy. And that's, that's where uh, you have niche products, you can link them together, and uh, it means you have to have low inventory costs or low way of delivering and a platform that allows you to get to that. <clears throat> so I'm not sure. Wayfair is exactly that model, but they started off, they had multiple different websites buying very specific things, um, and they knitted those together. Uh, there are other examples of um, uh, long tail. eBay is an example, and the early Netflix was an example. They went out and bought a lot of, a lot of content you know, that uh, not everyone wanted to see, you know, an older movie or something. But they had a lot of that there, and it satisfied people. And then they had a, um, a suggestion engine that says, well, if you like, you know, romantic comedies from the 1950s, you know, may I suggest some other things? So that's a long tail model. <clears throat> Multi-sided platform is another um, thing that's in the book, and that's really where you've got to have a group, of, two groups of people come together, you can create value. So, for example, if you're developing uh, video game uh, consoles, hardware, and you want to sell that, you need, you need to have people that want to buy it, right, to so use it. But they're not going to buy it unless there's content on it. So you've got you've to get the, the game developers there. The game developers don't want to spend a lot of time developing games if you don't have enough people that want to play the games. And so 
if you can orchestrate all that together, you can get a dominant uh, position in that. Uh, other examples were some of the iTunes uh, things. A couple of other things were sort of the free model. Free as a business, that's where uh, we, all, we all do that, right? How many, the, the internet is nobody wants to pay for anything. Um, and the free model is, well, if we can tr attract enough people by giving away something, we can figure out how to monetize them through some other fashion, through other parts of the business model or some other group. Out of that evolved the premium model. A freemium model, people have heard of that one, right? That, that says, you know, I got a bunch of free users, but I could add additional features that some people will pay for. And if I do it right, I maybe only need to convert 9, 10% of my free users to something to have a, a viable business. So examples of, uh, of that would be if you have iCloud, for example, you get, what, like five gigabytes of storage, and then you can, they'll charge you above that. Or um, Skype, where they'll add a different additional services you could pay for. Uh, the key here <coughs> is, and it's the metrics. What is the cost of adding people <coughs> and, and servicing them, and, wh and what rate do they convert? And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, metrics when you think about business models. And the final <clears throat> example that I thought would be interesting to tell you about was the open source model that um, Red Hat was the one. The idea there is open source, we have the community building all this stuff for free. And the problem is if I want to take, that's great, but if I want to take that to a business, the business wants predictability and they want to have uh, something that they know works. So if I can be an intermediary there, I can take the open source core stuff, I can layer uh, things on it that, that make it uh, useful, make sure that I'm the buffer between the open source community and the companies that I'm going to sell to. <clears throat> and what I do is I sell them a subscription for vetted upgrades and maybe services for implementation. Now Red Hat also worked against Microsoft at the time. Microsoft servers were expensive, Linux was cheap, you could get it for free. Red Hat said, well, you know, we can take and put, put it at modest cost for you. And for a lot of people in data centers, getting off the Microsoft platform and onto Linux through Red Hat was a good thing. And Red Hat, you know, grew like crazy. So those are some examples of um, some of the business models that are discussed in that book. It's worth a read. I just wouldn't be seduced by the fact that I, I um, I, I even had a, a business model canvas presented to me three months ago by a major consumer products company, and it was all fluff. I mean, it was just, as I said to one of the principals on the other side, I said, if that business model canvas had been presented in a class that I taught, it would barely get a C. It was so bad, because it was all fluff. There was no substance behind it. So it's a useful way, but there's got to be substance. Anyway, I don't have any bias, you see. OK, so I want to give you another way to think about um, business models. This is from Chesboro. Um, and the thought here is by exposing you to different models and ways people use it, you'll have more of a foundation to think about your particular situation. So business model canvas was an example. We gave you some examples of some things in the past. And then Chesboro has a framework. And these are the six components of his model. So let's go through those. The first is a value proposition. We already talked about that. Uh, and Bob talked about it. The key thing here is to be looking at the value. What's the value of this from the customer's perspective? Uh, another way of talking the way Bob talked about it. The second is the market segment. You know, what exact market are you going after? Is it high-end you know, watches or mass market watches? Each segment has different needs. Uh, which means you have to figure out how to deliver things to different segments and different uptake rates. Uh, the third is value chain structure. You know, where are you going to position yourself in the value chain? Now, how many people have heard of value chains? There's, okay, a few. This is one that's always a little confusing, so I thought I'd give you a little example of a value chain. You know, tonight, let's call it food. Uh, tonight or tomorrow night, you're going to want to go home and eat dinner. And there are a number of ways you could do it. You could go through the traditional value chain for a supermarket. So 
you know, we have a seed manufacturer that sells it to a distributor, the distributor to the farmer, farmer harvests the crops, it goes to a food product manufacturer, it gets distributed to wholesalers, it goes to a supermarket, you go to the supermarket and you shop, and there you go, you have dinner. Now, what do we know about supermarket um, profitability? Are they profitable? No, very low margin. Margin is the concept of uh, what you get minus what, what it costs. So when you go to a checkout at a supermarket, they have all those impulse buy things there because they want you to just, you go in for some milk and eggs and you buy the stuff from the checkout. So someone said, well, you know, what if we change the value chain a little bit? What if we talked about the supermarket making some prepared meals, right? So now they, you can go to supermarkets now and you can buy carrots or you can buy something that's made that's all cooked up. And so then you, you know, take it home and you have dinner. Now what that's done is it's taken you know, carrots at a dollar a pound and probably transformed it through some value add into something that might be the equivalent of four or five dollars a pound. That's a different value chain, all delivering the food you're gonna eat it at the end of the day. Now, a restaurant is another place you can eat dinner, and it's got basically the same part of the chain, but it has a, it takes all of that stuff, prepares it, and you can go there and you can get a dining experience, and it's gonna cost you more, presumably, but it's another way of a value chain around food. Um, and then, of course, sometimes it's a hassle to actually go to a restaurant or you don't wanna get dressed up, so what if we could deliver it? That's Grubhub. Right, so they, they st sit in there and they've, uh, they have to work with the restaurants and then they have to go into a local delivery service and bingo, you're having dinner. Again, a set of value, a set of activities delivering value to somebody who's consuming a meal. And then of course, another one in this area would be home chefs where you have somebody like Blue Apron and their activities that they have to do is they have to plan and produce the meals they have to ship it, and then you cook it. And it's a nice evening with your significant other making dinner. Now, the, the activities that are needed at each of these are quite different. And where you focus and the cost to do it is something as you're thinking about which business model you want to use. Uh, these have implications for them. So Grubhub you know, comes in. It's probably going to be public, or is it going public pretty soon? Blue Apron is public. It's Stock has dropped a huge amount because you know, the economics aren't quite there. But these are examples of value chain as you're thinking about, you know, you've got your customer, and this is gonna partly define your customer segment because not everyone wants to fix, do a blue apron thing. And some people would just soon pick it up in the supermarket and some people will do all. You know, they'll pick up a prepared meal some night and they'll get a grub hub the other night and maybe I, you know, for the weekend, you know, let's try some meals that, uh, some recipes I never would have tried. So that's value chain. Um, the next component when you're thinking about it is, okay, so if I choose this particular model, what are the revenue and cost implications? Now, Charlie Tillett's gonna come in next week when he does financial planning or, or projections, and he'll talk about this component of it. So we'll just leave that there as something you gotta consider, because at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out, can I, I capture value in this, can I make money so I can do it again? And then another component that Chesborough talks about is position in the value network. Are there places in the network where we can, we can multiply value, where we can together create more value? An example of that is the Intel, a thing that drove all the adoption of Microsoft Windows and Intel-based processors. The two of them complemented each other to deliver a lot of value that neither of them alone could do. And so by partnering in a value chain. And there may be effects where you can deliver extra value. So credit card companies and airlines and rewards are an example where it benefits both the airlines and the card, credit card company and presumably delivers more value to you. So if you can find around you and what you're planning to do places where you can cooperate or complement, you know, that can be a component of thinking about a model. And then finally, what's the, <clears throat> what's the competitive strategy that's gonna allow you, once you do this, to, to get a sustainable 
competitive advantage, which is the buzzword for how do we know this is going to last? How will it be someone won't just copy it? And that can be anything from intellectual property. It could be speed to market. It could be a bunch of things, but you have to figure out where you're going to do that to make sure you have a sustainable business. So those are the six components that Chesborough talks about. Again, these slides will be available. I think they may be even on the website right now. OK. Uh, question, yeah. Integration could be also like uh, value, add value to, for example, in, in Colombia, uh, the, the coffee growers, they integrate and they go to the retail. OK. One by less. So right. they, they have the chains, they integrate. Right. They really have to create more profit. All right. So the point is sometimes integration is a part of that's sort of almost like it's either the complementors or it's a different value chain. If you think of the broadcast, uh, radio broadcast market, the value chain for um, creating the NBC network is a little bit different than the value chain that delivers the local broadcasts. It's, it's related, but it's sort of a branch off of it. So integrating, that's a classic way to integrate forward or backwards or up or down, uh, where you can uh, add value in some ways. Um, so I want to talk a bit about lean startup. Have people, how many people have heard of that term? OK. It's good. I was, I was afraid when I put up there, you know, every hand goes up, and then I have to tell you stuff you already know. This has been a popular, you know, in the, in the world of, of business, the, they have these trends that come along, and everyone, it's the latest, hottest trend, and you're supposed to know that. And uh, everyone runs around it, and professors who put it out there make a bunch of money lecturing on it and stuff. And then it goes down, and a new one comes up. But the point is, people know about this, and they do have there are different ways of looking at it, and so you ought to be familiar with it. And for the, um, it's called the Lean Startup. Uh, Eric Rice is the author, and and basically, it's almost what you do in science. You have a hypothesis, and you go out and figure out how to test it, and then you learn from it. And so the guy, the goal is to build a sustainable business around a vision that you've tested. That's that's the basic. And that sustainable thing is your business model. So the, when you're doing a plan, you have a set of assumptions. And the strategy in the plan is based on the assumptions. And the question is, are the assumptions good? So if we think about the Xerox case, there was a plan. There was a, there was a model that they were going to go out and test. And the question is, how do you test it as quickly as possible? And the concept is validated learning. You, you test, you look, you try something else until you hone in on what the real value is. Sort of Bob's uh, thing last night with um, his newest company, Food for Sleep. You know, you had uh, these, the hypothesis was that working moms were harassed and needed to get sleep, and they would, you know, do that. And he found that that was not the case. But he found, by asking that question, he found people where it did validate. It was women who were running, and then more broadly, um, athletes. Uh, so how do you do it? Um, I've talked about create value and capture value. In this book, the create value is the value hypothesis. It's the term used in the lean startup. And the create value is the growth hypothesis, I mean capture value. And so the value hypothesis is an idea of whether a product or service is really delivering the, the value that you think. And the concept is you build a minimum viable product that tests that. The, the minimum experiment you need to do that can be done quickly where you can test out the hypothesis. And the classic case is Zappos. Everyone's probably used Zappos or Zappos, the shoe company, where you order online. It, went, it got acquired for, I think, a billion dollars by Amazon, I think it was. And so their minimum viable product was, hypothesis was, people would buy shoes online without trying them on or anything. That sort of would have been a hard one um, for me, as I, I, a lot of shoes don't fit. <laughs> so, well, so what did they do? The question is, would they buy it online? So they went out and they took pictures of shoes. And they posted them up on a website. And they put a minimum order page there. They didn't build the back end order processing, inventory control, credit card processing. If you ordered them, they would, and they didn't build inventory. They'd literally go down to the local store, buy the shoes, 
take it back, put their label on it, and ship it to you. So they were testing, would people buy? And that's how they did it, very minimal. You can do that pretty quickly. Of course, all of the, the point about the cost, you know, <laughs> you're buying them at retail and you're selling them. You know, you're not making any money on this, but you're learning. And what they learned in the process was people said, oh, you know, can I return these? What's your return policy? And so they tested that. And they said, well, free returns. And then they found, well, people would buy if they knew they could return. And that launched the whole thing. And then when they figured that out, and then there were a lot of tweaks around that, then they could build all the other stuff that went around it. Enough so that, you know, today you could still do that. When my daughter um, got married, uh, the wedding dress or something, it was very unclear what size heel would work. So she ordered five different pairs. And she was not going to wear five pairs of shoes on her wedding day in her wedding gown. Uh, and she sent four back. She buys a lot of other things on Zappos. But it's the kind of thing, this was the minimum viable product, and they learned something from it, and it gave them the uh, solution to how to position and grow the business. Um, now, the growth hypothesis, once you figure out, OK, I, I got customers that will buy something, or they'll do something. How, do I, how am I actually going to make this grow? And there, the, the question is, where generally do customers come from uh, when you grow? Well, usually from other customers in some fashion. And so there are, there are different ways that can happen. There's word of mouth. An example was TiVo. Uh, there's a side effect of product usage. You know, that's like uh, Facebook or PayPal. There's actually funded advertising you know, as a way to grow, paid ads. And then uh, subscriptions is another way as you begin to offer things. When you move into the growth hypothesis, the question is, how do I actually figure out whether I have a model that works. And the trick is to come up with a metric that actually measures what you think you're testing. It's not the traditional revenue, cost, or anything. And so uh, these are things that we want to measure so we can learn and, and make the model work. So examples are, there are a couple of en engines of growth here. There's a sticky. Uh, engine where uh, you know once you subscribe, uh, you're not going to change easily. Most people they stick with it, and but the question for the metric for that is the churn rate. You know I have customers that I bring in. How many can I retain, and what percentage do I have to retain at what economics uh, to make this a model that I can actually scale and grow? If it's a viral uh, model where one customer leads you to other customers. You want to look at um, the, uh, the viral coefficient. How many people, if I can get to one customer, will that customer get me to? So some of the Facebook advertising is you know, targeted to people that have big friend networks, for example. Um, it's sort of like, an, it's like a virus. How many people will they infect? When you come to a paid engine, you know, where you're paying advertising, it's things like, um, what's the cost to get somebody in? And then what's the lifetime value? So if it costs you $5 to get someone in, and the lifetime value of that customer it turns out is $5, you're, you're not ahead. And so those are ways to test and tweak your model on growth until you get it right, or decide maybe it is, isn't going to work. Which leads us to the pivot. People have heard of the pivot? That was so trendy a few years ago. Everyone was pivoting. And the, and the joke used to be, well, those are people in the valley that raise money, don't really know what they're doing, and they just totally changed their model. And there was some of that going on. But in the context of lean startup, if we if we're have a hypothesis of who the customer is, why they buy, and how we'll grow it, and we find out as we try to scale it that it's not working or not working well enough, then we have to think, rethink the model. It's like resetting it or pivoting to a different one. And so there are, um, there are a number of different pivot types. Um, the, um, the first one, I'll see if I can give you some examples. The first one is the zoom in pivot. You have a product, and it's not, it's not catching on, or it's, it's not doing it. Is there something you're doing that could be the product by itself? that would make it work. An example that came out of the 100K competition was Dial-A-Fish. 
It was the winner, I think, in the second year. Was it the second year? Yost? And it was before the internet, but it was really the idea that you could, um, came out of a mechanical engineering class on technologies for aging people. And what they realized is, well, older people have to shop, and it's hard for them to get to the grocery store. And so they built um, a thing that went with your telephone, which was a little a barcode reader wand that connected to your phone. And you dial up a number, and the, the, the phone would talk to you. And you know, do you like to order? And they had a catalog. And so it, press, it said, press one if you wanted to order. You press one scan your first item, and they'd take the pen, which is connected to the phone, and they'd scan the barcode in the catalog. And the phone would read back and say, Del Monte Peas, 12 ounces, 95 cents, or whatever. Yeah. And that's how you did it. This was all pre-internet. And, um, and they went out and they, they, studied, they went to supermarkets, and they, they looked at surveys, and they said, you know, what activity do people have to do a lot? Shopping for groceries. And what activity do people not like to do a lot? Shopping for groceries. And they said, this is great. You know, We have a way you can do this and shop. You don't even have to. Back then, supermarkets weren't open 24 hours a day. And so they said, this is a great, great business. And so they, just, they decided to, they won the competition, um, probably because I think they were the only, back in those days, the only plan that ever said customer. The rest of them read like uh, grant proposals, except for Yos. <laughs> Um, I mean, they went out there and they realized, and so the economics made a lot of sense. If you go to a grocery store, you know, they rent space, typically. They don't own it. They've got to keep everything looking somewhat clean for you, right? And they've got to refrigerate stuff. There's a lot of overhead uh, with it, and that's why the margins may be so low. But if you could fulfill a grocery order out of a warehouse, you know, that would be good. The other thing with grocery stores is that... Um, uh, they typically, if they're renting space, the landlord gets a percentage of the gross. So for every dollar that they take in, he gets 2% or 2 cents or whatever. And so the idea is if you could move a lot of this activity into the warehouse, you know, you could save, you could make grocery stores smaller, there are a bunch of things. So they went and they talked to stores, and as you can imagine, there were some compelling economics, but it was just very slow. I mean, they talked to Kroger. I took him in, and one of my, at the time, one of my law partners was the former general counsel of First National Stores, and he gave him a lot of insight on, on how it worked. And they said, well, you know, we could get there eventually, but we, it's not going to work for us. Well, what they did is they looked around and they said, what is it that we have here that's valuable, that's unique? And it turned out to be that voice system over the telephone. So they sold off the, the, the stylus, the barcode reader, to a company. And they focused on developing the software around what became visual voice. What they recognized was, uh, at the time, if you wanted to have a private um, telephone system you know, in an office, you'd have to buy these expensive PBX systems that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But with the PC, you could put that stuff on a, on a, on a personal computer. And so visual voice became the software you could buy that would allow you to set up voicemail and call routing and everything else on a PC. And that thing took off because they zoomed in on a, on a particular value thing. And they ended up selling it to a public company that re, um, re, um, relocated its entire research operation to Cambridge. <laughs> Mike Cassidy, the guy, one of the three founders, went on to do Direct Hit, which uh, won later on in the competition and was a search engine sold to Ask Jeeves. He then went on and did um, multiplayer games. And he was at Google running one of their the moon project. And he's off doing some other things now. So serial entrepreneur. So that's uh, Zoom in. Uh, Zoom out is um, the idea, you know, I've got a product, but it's not fulfilling the complete need. There's something more here. So Yelp is an example of that. Yelp started off as an email system platform for people to query other people for recommendations. And they realized, well, rather than an email system, if they opened it up and made it a fuller thing along with recommendations that were posted and things, it became the Yelp system you know. Um, the customer segment um, pivot, excuse me, 
is an example of what Bob said last night. You know, he had a proposition and he found within his proposition a different subset of customers that led him not only to a subset of the working moms, but realized that those people were, in addition to being working moms, were athletes. And athletes recognized the value of a product that allowed them to sleep and train better, and they would pay uh, for better performance. Um, then the um, customer need uh, pivot, PayPal is an example of that. It was originally a crypt cryptography play to encrypt uh, sending of money from one uh, mobile device to another back in the days. They were called PDAs in that day. And they realized through that that uh, they, if they were actually a platform for people to pay from, uh, they could uh, pivot on that form. A platform example is we have a platform that others can use. An exa classic example of that is Amazon, right? Amazon Cloud, AWS, was recognized. And we built this whole system to support our Amazon retail stuff. And we learned how to load balance and bring servers up and down. We have expertise there. Why don't we offer that to other people? And that became AWS, which was, I think even today, is the most profitable part of Amazon. Uh, business architecture pivot, it's really, you might move from a high margin, uh, small number of uh, customers to a low margin, um, large number of customers. Classic way companies get started is they do consulting with customers. So they build things for them, they learn from the customers. And that's, that's a great way to, to fund yourself as you're delivering value to a customer. Um, the problem is that consulting is a pretty high margin business. You probably charge it out at twice your actual cost. And the transition to maybe productize what you're doing into something that could go more mass market, that's a very difficult transition because you, know, you have one customer who pays you $100,000, and now you've got to get how many customers that will pay you $500? And how do you transition through that? But that's a pivot that's happened. Uh, other examples are uh, engine of, uh, of uh, growth pivot, the original Hotmail. They, they got subscribers in you know, by marketing to them. And then somebody one day said, well, if we put at the bottom of each message that went out under Hotmail, click here to get a free Hotmail account, then when I send an email to Yoast, he might say, oh, I might try that. And then he sends an email and then you know, to 10 people, and that was, they, they adopted that model that, that uh, got them going. Um, a technology pivot, uh, that's often, it's often something large companies do. They're, they're providing something to their customers, and uh, they either want to extend their brand by offering additional things, or they're trying to stave off competition, and they, they adopt a new technology to do the same thing. It can be done with startups. In some ways, that's sort of what disrupting a disruptive innovation is from a startup perspective. So I, I thought I would introduce you to some of those concepts. The book tells you more about it, and it's worth a read. Um, any questions on Lean Startup? Yeah. I'm thinking about how accessible platform. Excuse me, how you? Uh, Multi-sided platform, yeah. This, this lean startup network, because, I mean, basically, the value is generated for one side, actually it's coming from the other side, existing side. Right. The other side. So the question is, in a multi-sided platform, I'm guessing, how do you come up with the minimum viable product that figures out whether you got the formula right? Yeah, because if yeah. you, I mean, you are risking too much, I think, by yeah. testing something which may have multi-sided. Well, remember, you don't have to build a huge thing. You just have to do enough to make it see that it works. <clears throat> you know, um, it's not quite the same thing, <clears throat> but the original Dropbox stuff was really um, a vi some videos explaining how it worked, even though they hadn't actually built enough of it to get people to do that. So you can be creative in thinking, how can I test it? See, the mindset is, you know, we're all trained to be very rigorous. You know, we, we solve problem sets, we do things. This is more about how can I get creative to test out whether the idea I have works without spending a lot of time or money. 
And um, it doesn't have to be, it's not going to be the finished product, <clears throat> but it's going to be something, hopefully, that tests something like the Zappos thing. I mean, forget building a fancy website. Just have some nice pictures there. You know, no order entry, no inventory, no, no credit card. And, you know, <clears throat> there was a company in the internet bubble called, I think, gov.com. And their hypothesis was, everything got funded in the internet bubble. But their hypothesis was, eventually, you're going to be doing a lot of transactions with governments online. You know, no going down to the registry of motor vehicles and standing in line for an hour or to the assessor's office to pay your, uh, your property tax. So they put up a website, and um, you, you, um, you entered the bills there, and you actually paid them. They turned around, filled out the forms, put them in envelopes, put a stamp on it, and mailed it to the governor. And they were trying to test out the idea, would people use it, and what were the impediments to it. And if they got enough people using it, then they had a captive audience, and they could then turn around on the other side and say to governments, you know, you really want to open up all these envelopes with stamps? What if we could batch these together and do something? And so that's an example of, you know, doing the minimum kind of, kind of thing. So it's, the, the point of these is that there's no general formula of how to do it, but it's the questions. How would I test it? And, how, you know, I've got this limited resources and this limited time, and I've got to convince somebody, me, because I'm trying to be the entrepreneur here, or the financing people that I want to have on board or the engineer I want to come and, you know, team up with. You know, what do I need to do to get those people believing in the vision, including me? Because <laughs> if this doesn't work, as Bob said, uh, I'm a good jockey. I maybe just got the wrong horse. And I'll go find another horse. Okay, <clears throat> so business models. Here's some more examples, um, just so you're familiar with the term. Subscription, you know about that. Those are magazines and other kinds of things. Razor, razor blade, we talked about. That was the original um, Gillette model. And it's, again, it's the idea that you, you sell the basic thing and you make your money on the replacements. Inkjet printers, that's a classic example of that. You know, <laughs> I think I bought an inkjet printer a couple of years ago, a multi, you know, an office thing, where the cost of the whole machine was about maybe... 30% more than the cost of the refills I had to buy. You know, and they only gave you enough for maybe 100 copies. And so I thought, what a bargain, you know, 100 bucks. And then I go down and buy the ink, and it's, you know, 85 bucks for the ink. Um, Multi-level marketing, that's Amway, sort of a distributor marketing. Uh, network effects, where you're, you're using the network uh, to reach people, Facebook kind of things. Um, cutting out the middlemen, that's sort of any kind of the disruptive um, online retail versus, you know, distributors and all of that stuff. Uh, Bricks and Clicks was a Barnes and Noble thing. You can go to the store, you can get it online. I can reach you in both places. That was a key thing with many of the retail companies. If you bought online for a while there, and let's say you wanted to return it, some, some of the <laughs> stores you couldn't return it to the store. You know, well, why can't I take it to Macy's? I got one, you know, 10 minutes away. Why do I have to go and ship it back? Because they hadn't put their systems together. But the idea that I could buy it online and return it in a store or, or get an order in a store and get it delivered at home, you know, that's a bricks and clicks. Loyalty business model, Nord, Nordstrom, where you have your shopping advisor. Was there a question way up there? Okay, this is idea. I'm doing this for the video. This is the question is around idea yeah, testing. You mentioned before that yep. you should be using any model to test your idea. Right. So, so what I feel is that when you test your idea, you're kind of making your idea open to the public while you are acting on ready to launch it. Okay. You're just testing it. So yep. How do you ensure that the timing is correct and you don't just let your idea go to someone who is probably more prepared than you? Okay. So... So the question is, the idea of testing is good, but once you start testing, people are going to see what you're doing, and how do you make sure people don't take it? And so that's, that is a question. You may not want to do a particular kind of test that way or make it as public. Um, and again, it's all situational dependent. Uh, if you have uh, patent filings, we'll talk about patents tomorrow night, uh, then you have less concern about you know, things that are patentable once you've uh, done the filing on it. Uh, but that's it. You would have to design a test 
of an idea that you could do and be comfortable with. Um, and maybe you can figure out something or maybe you can't. So if you can't, then the lean startup thing is not the, the formula you're going to have to follow. You're going to have to figure something else. And it may just be talking to people and listening. You know, what's your biggest fear, as Bob said, uh, when he was talking about regain, or sorry, night bite. Does that answer it? OK. Um, let's see. Loyalty business, servitization, that's really where you outsource you know, services to someone. And low cost business model would be like the JetBlue, where you just sort of change the whole model. You know, what it, the, I mean, the airlines have this really figured out. I was looking at a basic economy thing, and I, I think they give you a seat on the plane if you sign up for it, but it wasn't exactly clear to me. <laughs> you had to pay for everything. Um, when you look at the models and you think about them, <clears throat> you have to begin to think about, you know, what are the pros and cons? So here's some different kinds of models you might look at, direct and retail, et cetera. And I'm going to just take a couple of them and walk you through the kind of questions you might want to ask as you're evaluating them. So in direct sales means you're sending one of your people or somehow contacting the customer directly. That's, and so the positives here are you have high contact. You're talking to the actual customer. You have a relationship with that customer if you do it. You have more control because you get to pick who you're talking to and how often you interact, at least how often you plan to interact. You can do it for multiple <clears throat> purposes. Uh, I, can, I can go for, to sell you one thing, and then, oh, by the way, we have this other product. So it can be a channel for you. And you've got, actually got your experts out there talking to customers. So there's a lot of benefit in direct sales. What are some of the negatives to direct sales, as you, if, you, if you think about it? What would you worry about? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, the cost. Yeah, it costs a lot of money to go direct. In fact, you'd be kind of stupid to do this for an item that was a dollar item. You know, it would have to be a much more expensive item. That's one thing. <clears throat> yep. Any? Yep. It's difficult to scale and reach out to the, uh, to, to the customer. Yeah, how do you scale it, right? Is, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So they're scaling. It may work for a kind of, but we haven't talked yet about, you know, the assumption probably implicit, is everyone wants to go start a company, have it grow hugely, you know, go public. And that's, that's sort of the entrepreneurial you know, dream thing. But that doesn't necessarily have to be it. It really comes down to what you as an entrepreneur want to do. You know, what are your goals? And um, if you <clears throat> direct sales may work very well if you don't want to you know, take on the cost of trying to scale a big business. You can have a very nice business, very profitable business, um, without growing it huge. But that's a personal decision. So here are some of the things. Sometimes it can be free consulting. You know, you got the salespeople out there, and the customer milks you for information and learns about it. That happens. Uh, the customer may not like the rep, the, the sales rep. So, and it's high cost, as, as you pointed out. And you have the issue of how do you retain the direct sales force? Because the salespeople will go, if they don't see your product has got traction and they can sell a lot of it, you know, they're going to wait until they get their bonus for the year and they're going to be looking to go somewhere else. So retaining a sales force of expensive people is hard. What about <clears throat> if we say, let's, well, I don't want to have a direct sales force. Let's go through a channel. Let's go through distributors. So the positives is the cost of sales is low. You're not, you're not paying for the salespeople, right? Um, you, you don't really have to worry about sales. That's the distributor's issue. Uh, you might get exposure in new markets because depending on the distributor, they may take you to different kind of customers. Um, you may get credibility because the distributor is a known person and you're a little startup. You know, like, who am I going to buy for? Uh, and a potential speed because they may have many people. And it may give you a competitive edge where you can keep uh, your co competition out or get ahead of them. What would be some of the negatives, maybe, for going to, with, with a distributor? Yeah? So you can't control what your distributor is pushing to the customer. You might be easily pushing your competitors. Yeah, you can't control it. When I did the first vertical market deal for <laughs> Wang Computers. Wang Computers uh, sold computers as sort of horizontally. They didn't care what market they were in. They actually didn't call them computers. It was office automation. But I had a banking, back in my law days, a banking 
uh, a client that had built a banking system for medium, small to medium-sized community banks on a Wang system. And that was the first distributor that vertical market that Wang went into. And we were worried very much about, you know, is the sales force going to be motivated? So part of our deal was it was, it was actually negotiating with them with what kind of incentives were they going to put on the table for the sales force? Because otherwise, you could just be another item in the book. And um, if the sales force is not motivated, it's just going to be another item in the book. Anything else? Was there another up here? Where, which you guys decide. <laughs> Right, right. So the channel is going to own the customer. You don't actually have a direct relation, and, and it can you know, create a problem. Uh, Sears, back in the day when it was a powerhouse, you know, you'd get into Sears and you thought you were great, and then they'd come back and keep squeezing you on the price. Of course, they got, they're in good shape right now. Well, that's some of the things, exactly. There are upfront fees sometimes to get there. You know, you've got to train costs. You have no control. The customers are distant. I had a, or clients are distant. I had a, it's on the board of a company where 50% of our revenue was from royalties for software that was put in Cisco routers. And, and that was great, you know, huge margins on that. But the problem is at one point, Cisco decided, you know, they were going to do something different. And we didn't actually know where all of the stuff was. We didn't actually know where the customers were. And you think about having your, your revenue cut in half and not knowing who the customers <laughs> were. In some cases, the Cisco reps would come in and they'd add our product on, on top of it. There was something in the router and then there was another thing. And they would you know, throw that in and help me out on my order and some of the stuff was never deployed. So that's an example of uh, a rude awakening on that. Uh, there's a time to revenue, especially for a startup company, if you have to go train the channel and then support the channel and it's gonna take a long time for them to start selling. You know, your revenue is going to go out a lot farther than if you went direct. Um, and you may switch at some point. And it can require a lot of attention and training. So my point in these slides is as you think about different models, you have to go and think about, well, what are the benefits that I would get? And how does that fit with what I'm trying to do? And what are the negatives? And does this make sense? And maybe it makes sense. Maybe a distributor makes sense later after you've done the direct sales. But it's the kind of questions you have to ask. Um, so there's just some other examples of business models um, that are delivering similar kind of things. I'll just leave you to consider those because I'm running a bit behind here. I want to talk a little bit about business models and valuation. Does it matter what model you choose? There was some research done that looked at the uh, S&P 500 over 40 years. And they grouped companies into these four categories asset builders, people that built things, uh, service providers that you know, created, uh, delivered services to people, and you can see the examples there, technology creators, people that develop intellectual property, and network orchestrators, those that orchestrated a network into four groups. And the results were interesting. The network orchestrators outperformed on every measure, financial measure. They had higher margins, they had higher growth rates, and, and all of that. And the examples of that are the companies you're thinking about, Uber, that's orchestrating. You know, they don't buy the cars. The drivers buy the car. They orchestrate the environment around it. And um, you're getting value by enabling a whole network around it. it when I, from this slide, I don't mean to say that you should always think about being a network orchestrator. That may not work for you. But if you had a choice between one of the other models in this, this might be something you'd think about. You know, if I could think about this differently, could I create more value? It was just an interesting study, and there's a site there you'll see about it. And then I want to just talk about quickly business model implementation. What I'm going to do, given the time, these are six other questions that try to get at what the model looks like. I'm going to just go right through all those and get to the actual implementation thing. These are the setup for the implementation. There's six questions. Okay, so this is, this is an approach that says, those are the six questions that we just went through and you memorized, 
right? <laughs> you know, how do we create value? What are, we, what are our ambitions and everything else? And when you answer those questions, whatever those are, those are the foundational level. That sort of establishes something you want to do. But it could very well be easily uh, copied by competitors. So the question is, underneath that, is there a proprietary level? Are there unique combinations that will make this unique to you and make it uh, hard to copy? And if you find that, then how do you go about implementing all of that? So what does all this mean? Here's an example from Southwest Airlines. This is the actual implementation of this. The question was, how do we create value at the first level? And forgive me for reading it. They decided at Foundation they were going to sell services only. They were going to have a standardized offering, narrow breadth, shallow lines. They're going to sell the service themselves. They're going to de deliver it themselves. And they're going to be the direct distributor. That's the foundation of what they were going to do in creating value. The question is, how was it pri uh, proprietary? How did they think about it? They said, well, we're going to do short haul, low fare, high frequency, point to point service. We're going to deliver fun. We're going to serve only drinks. Uh, we're not going to assign seats. We're not going to use travel agents. And we're not going to, we're going to have fully refundable fares. So that was their way of implementing that model that they did, which is different than other people. So if they said that's a good model and they decided that worked, what are the rules that they set up to say when it comes to making decisions, how do we make sure we're making the right decisions? And some of the simple things they did is the maximum one-way fare should not exceed a certain amount. So as they planned their routes and where they went, that was one of the things they did. And the maximum food cost should be less than a certain amount. So they were specific rules that helped them in their planning and execution of the model. The second level of questions were, for whom do we create value? And at the foundation, they were uh, B2C and B2B. They were national. They were retail. They were broad market. Anyone could fly it, and they were transactional. They weren't really trying to initially create you know, a relationship. And the proprietary level on this was they did a managed evolution from regional airports. Uh, so in Boston, for example, they weren't at, at Logan. They went to Manchester, and they went to Green Airport in, in, in New Hampshire and Green Airport in Rhode Island, because there they could actually uh, have control over gates and other kinds of things. So they weren't going to go to major places initially. And the rules were specific guidelines uh, for serving cities and some idea of, you know, could we get this kind of penetration when they made their model. So it's not one, if you have a model and you don't have the rules and ways to implement it, then you just have a model. The third question under this framework is, uh, what are our core competencies? What are we good at? And is that what we want to focus on? And they said, well, we're really good at uh, production and operating systems. And so they, were, they implemented that by saying, we're going to be highly selective in hiring employees. We're not going to operate a hub and spoke initially. Uh, we're going to fly into uncongested airports of small cities. We're going to have an innovation an innovative ground approach, so underserved cities would be receptive to their kind of way of handling. They'd have more control over uh, operations on the ground. They would uh, have standardized um, aircraft, and they wouldn't do code sharing. And the rules they had put down to implement it was, we're going to have at least 20 departures per day from the airport. Maximum flight distance should only be a certain number of miles. Uh, flight time should be less than a certain number of minutes, and the turnaround should be less than 20 minutes because, again, they were high frequency. You could always get a, a flight. So if someone came along and said we should do something different, it provides a basis for saying, well, no, that's not our model. We're executing on this model. Um, the fourth component, how do we position ourselves? And their thing was image of excellence, consistency, and dependability. Uh, and they stressed on-time arrivals, low fares, passengers having a good time. You know, I think it can relate to some of these things with Southwest. And their rule was achieve the best on-time performance. That's how they measured their operations around it. Um, how do we make money? Fixed revenue source, high operating leverage, high volumes, low margins. And they had annual profitability as a result of using short-haul routes, high frequency, low fares, and, and efficiency. They were driving for efficiency. And their measure was 
maintaining cost per mile below a certain number. And the final thing was, what are our go uh, goals and ambitions? And they were a growth model. They had emphasis on growth that was consistent with the business model and not just putting things in wherever. It had to be consistent with the rest. And they adopted a managed rate of growth. So the reason I picked this was, I think we all understand probably of all flown Southwest, and you can probably relate to some of this. And the point is, uh, when you go through and say, how am I going to implement the model? How am I going to make my unique combinations proprietary where I can carve something out? And how do I actually implement it? What are the rules that I'm going to operate by? Some examples here, something you'll think about as you're trying to think about your model and as you grow the company. So with that, we covered all of, all of those things. And um, just to remind you, the business model is the part about how do we capture value. And uh, what I'd like to do now is switch and have a couple of pitches before the break with the purpose of the people pitching, just letting you know what they're doing, because I think they might want some team members. And then we'll take a break for you to all talk, and then you'll still be back and tell you about those gnarly issues around people. Thank you.